Thank you very much for inviting me to talk to you today about building a just culture for safety. The first point I'm going to make is that an awful lot of people say, all we need to do is change the culture. But we have to remember that culture consists of all of these different things, and often they're very entrenched. Our values, our ideas, our customs, our beliefs, and our behaviours. And these have been developed over generations. This is not an easy fix. If people say that we need to change the culture, you have to ask, what component of that culture do you want to change? Do you want to change the values or the attitudes or the ideas or the practices? Because those are the things that you can do to focus on changing the culture and ultimately creating a safer healthcare. It's important to recognize that human beings are simply amazing. They are incredibly adaptive. They constantly solve problems and adjust what they do depending on the situations they face. We rely on these people to keep our patients safe. But humans are also human. They can be inconsistent and unreliable. They get stressed, tired and can be rude. And they get distracted, forget things and get bored. Nobody is perfect, no matter how much experience, practice or attention they have. There is always the potential for a person, for a person to make a mistake. The problem is we build systems that expect perfection and we ourselves expect perfection of each other. And our patients and their families expect perfection too. This is why we need a just culture for safety. A just culture is where we treat people fairly and consistently, no matter what has happened. That we are open and transparent with everyone and we seek to learn before we judge. And we ensure that there is accountability and responsibility. That is that we take an account of what happened and that we are responsible for taking that account and implementing any changes that are needed. The five principles that can help you build a just culture are the following. All the way from error is normal through to how people respond and act to failure matters. And I'm going to take you through these one by one. Error is normal. Error are not choices. You can't remove error, but you can defend against the ine inevitability of it. And so you can build good systems that build in error tolerance. Blame fixes nothing. Blame implies that an error is a choice but it silences people. People are really frightened. It also leads to them feeling guilty, shameful. But blame also shifts the accountability from the system to the individual. So we didn't learn about what we can do differently. We might learn how we might ask a individual person who works in healthcare to stop making mistakes, but we don't learn how that system is setting them up to fail. When something's gone wrong, this is how people feel. They personalize it. It becomes pervasive and permanent. What that means is that people feel that it is absolutely all their fault. Not anyone else's, not the systems, not the members of the team, all down to me. And that it is going to ruin every bit of my life, my career, my family, the way people see me, the pride I have in what I do. And then I'm going to feel this bad forever. And unfortunately, as Sydney Decker says so beautifully here, in our drive to pinpoint the source of suffering, we succumb to the hunt for a scapegoat, possibly inflicting even greater suffering on others around us. When you look at incident reporting and incident investigations, and you see these comments, I was talking to someone while drawing it up. I messed up. I will be more careful in the future. You know that this person feels it's all down to them. And I will be more careful in the future is not a sustained recommendation for change. Which builds, brings me on to restorative just culture. 
Sydney Decker asks us to ask three very key questions. When something has gone wrong, who was hurt? What do they need? And whose obligation is it to meet that need? So who was hurt can be the patient and their family, but also their friends and the local community. It ripples and ripples out. But it also can be the staff, the people around them, and the people who lead them. And what they need can be very different. One person's need is not the same as another's. So you have to ask them, what do you need? And then you have to find someone or people whose obligation it is to meet that need, not just immediately, but over the period of time that everyone needs it. And this can go on for years. But in order to do that, we need a psychologically safe environment. People need to feel accepted and respected. They need to be able to belong and they need to be able to challenge when they have concerns or questions without any fear of repercussion. This is the brilliant work of Amy Edmondson. She's written numerous books and one of the most recent is The Fearless Organization. It was also used and found out in a study by Google who did something called Project Aristotle where they wanted to find the five best team dynamics. And they found that psychological safety was number one. But the rest of these are also really important for safety. Dependability that people can count on each other to get things done. But also I would add that people can count on each other when things go wrong. That we all know the right structure and clarity, that we know what we're doing. We have clear goals, roles and plans. That we have meaning in our work and that our work has impact. Those five dynamics are absolutely wonderful for creating a safety culture with just culture at its heart. The four stage of, stages of this go from inclusion safety, that members feel safe to belong to the team, to learner safety, that members are able to learn through asking questions, contributor safety, when members feel safe to contribute their own ideas, and the most hard, challenger safety. Members can question others' ideas or suggest significant changes. Which brings me on to the third point, learning and improving, which are vital for a just culture. And the latest, latest emergent ideas and philosophies from risk res resilience engineers such as Eric Holnagel. This is safety one and safety two. Safety one is where we learn from failure. We use methods and tools predominantly lifted from high risk industries fit for linear systems. And we improve things based on sometimes one failure. But he asked, why do we just learn from things that go wrong? And if we make a statement that 10% of the care that we provide can go wrong, what happens in the other 90%? And this leads us on to safety too, where we want to learn from the 90%, the success, and we want to learn using methods and tools fit for a complex system, which is what healthcare is. And all we need to do is ask, why has it failed this time when most of the time it goes okay? So safety one and safety two is using data such as incidents and serious incidents. And in the UK, we have things like never events to understand why it failed when normally day-to-day -day functionality works. And we look at the day-to-day -day functionality and an exceptional performance in understanding what safety looks like. It is far more proactive and positive. This is an evolving approach to manage failure by better understanding success. Instead of trying to prevent bad outcomes from occurring, we spend our time and energy ensuring the correct things happen. And workers are not seen as the problem, they're very much seen as the solution. So you ask them what they need in order to work safely. We find out what their world is like, not what we imagine it is like, but what it is actually like. And that learning is knowing about how that work is done, 
how the normal everyday functionality happens, and we use the failure or the areas of high risk to study how they normally go okay. And we ask ourselves, what is happening when nothing bad is happening? But context drives that behavior. Complex systems do not lend themselves to, to traditional methods used for linear systems. That is production lines or systems that follow one thing after another after another. The environment, resources and conditions in which people work mainly determines the way they behave and act. And we need to make it easy for people to do the right thing and difficult to do the wrong thing. But health, healthcare is a complex adaptive system, which is where we have a dynamic network of people and tasks acting in parallel, constantly reacting to what other people and tasks are doing, which in turn influences behavior, decisions and choices. So all of this is all going on in the same time. And the more complex the work is, the more likelihood for error. And we place frontline staff in more and more complex environments and are shocked when they make more mistakes. Complexity will always create error opportunities and can lead people to adapt and adjust a rule in order to maintain safety. But how we respond and act when failure really matters. You can blame or punish, or you can learn and improve. You can judge, or you can seek to learn. You can be harsh and unkind, or you can be compassionate and kind. Sadly, at some point, bad things are going to happen. And what people need is that they need someone to hold on to. The most powerful thing we can do for one another as human beings is to hold them gently listen and be kind, no matter what's happened, whether it's something good or something's bad, you need to make people feel loved and supported. A little word or two about kindness. It is so much more than simply being nice. It is about being clear, thoughtful, respectful, compassionate and caring. And it's not avoid, about avoiding hard decisions or hard conversations. It is about giving people a way out with dignity. It is unkind to be unclear. So whenever you see someone do something really lovely, stop for a minute and highlight it. Show them, tell them, offer them the chance to gain an insight. Highlight that pattern that may be already with, within them and help them recognize it. And when you do so, you will help them want to do it again. Because when people are recognized for what they do, they are 23% more effective. And when they're appreciated, they are 43% more effective. Recognition increases staff engagement and satisfaction by as much as 11%. So what can you do to help build a just culture? Be clear that error is normal. Even the best people can make mistakes. Don't use blame as the solution, it fixes nothing. Make sure your goal is key to learn and improve. Understand the context and conditions that people are working in. Respond and act with kindness, fairness and respect. Thank you for listening.